joining us because I didn't turn on the right buttons. Welcome. <laughs> uh, and thank you for communicating with Carrie Brissow to tell us that we had kind of messed that up. The good news is you only missed the introduction. And Peter Conlon is with us and Emily Kornheiser, and they're going to talk about um, really education financing. Peter Conlon was just starting to talk about how we got into the financial mess that we're currently in. Did I capture that right? I don't think you Perhaps. described just a mess. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say I, I do come from the a little bit of, from the perspective of a school board member. I served on our school board for 17 years, uh, many of those years as chair and during the time that we uh, unified into a single um, district. Would you like me to use that? Or are we okay? Okay, great. Uh, so what we really had sort of converging as school boards were getting down to work uh, on their budgets across the state in the fall of 2023 to create those budgets that were presented on town meeting day in 2024 was really a kind of a convergence or a perfect storm of a number of things. Probably first and foremost was the loss of significant federal dollars that flowed into our school districts during COVID and really designed to address heightened student need uh, as a result of the pandemic and the lost, uh, the learning loss and whatnot. And that, that money had to be expended and was expended by a certain deadline. And that left schools that had probably, you know, I think most every school district put on needed staff, behavior specialists, um, special education aides, um, uh, folks to uh, help tutor kids. They, the schools didn't see a loss in any student need. The student need continued and continues to be very heightened. So a lot of those costs that they had built into their budgets while federal funding was available remain. Uh, and um, so that was one of the driving forces. We also had healthcare settlements or, or healthcare increases um, for our public school employees that topped 16%. Now, um, when we talk about healthcare, healthcare is about 30 to 40% of your payroll. So when that and your payroll and benefits and all of that are between 70 and 80% of your school budget. So when the healthcare costs go up almost 17%, that's a big number. Uh, these are numbers that are, are, um, are sort of locked in because of long-term uh, negotiated agreements. Uh, and so that's a, another factor. We also had um, really a, uh, an unprecedented increase in um, wages for public school employees. Those are, are, are negotiated locally, but across the state where we used to see between two and 4% increases annually, we started seeing six to 10% uh, increases annually. Those are, you know, sort of a number of factors that came up. We can add in the fact, and you obviously feel this very much in Woodstock, we have a, a, a aging um, uh, infrastructure. And you know those costs that we have deferred and deferred and deferred for for decades are really starting to hit home. Um, so these are the things that really came came together. So statewide, we had an increase in education spending of between two hundred and forty and two hundred and fifty million dollars. We haven't seen that kind of increase before. If we sort of use the um, uh, kind of rule of thumb that every $10 million is about uh, a penny on the tax rate or, or on the a penny on the tax rate, that translates to a tax rate increase overall statewide of about 24 cents. Uh, and, you know, that translates down to about a 20% increase in tax rates. Peter, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, because the increase in ARPA funds was really meant to be temporary because it's not long term but what you're saying is that the things that it funded to deal with the stress on the school system because of remote learning and whatever else was happening is more than just temporary is permanent or it hasn't abated those needs have not abated I, I think that if you were to talk to any educator anywhere in the state frankly probably anywhere in the country you would find out that the level of student need especially when it comes to caring for their mental health and just helping shepherding kids through a school day uh, 
is at a level that, that educators have never seen before. Um, and if any of you are educators, you can probably vouch for that. No. And of course, with schools, you know, they don't pick and choose who walks in the door. Whoever shows up, they educate and they have to educate to the best of their ability. And that generally means additional services if there's heightened need. And a related question to that, uh, is that it used to be that through the designated agencies, the mental health services would be provided to the school system. But my understanding from some members of the administration in our local school system is that those services are no longer as readily available from those agencies. Here is healthcare and rehabilitation services. Yeah. Is that accurate? It is accurate. Uh, we can, that, you know, um, sort of funnels down to our, the inability to hire the staff needed by our designated agencies to provide those services within the schools. I think in a perfect world, the um, the sort of education entities would be uh, would, would like to have the designated agencies take full responsibility for mental health services within schools. But that's just not possible because there's a limited number of people who are skilled and able to do that work. Uh, and um, you know, it, it comes down to uh, being able to hire the right people. And we can, we'll probably circle down to, as we do with every conversation in Vermont now, lack of housing. Emily? So all across the state, districts were warning budgets that were significantly higher than they had been in previous years because of all the reasons that Peter described, as well as just like basic inflation, heating costs were up, supply costs were up, all of those things. Um, and, you know, as with the health insurance, those are things that impact all of us. It's not just something that was happening in the schools. And so all of these individually warned budgets and individually voted budgets were coming in significantly higher than we'd ever seen before. And each individual school and school district and school budget is sitting in its own community and having internal conversations. And generally, it's and that's normal. People aren't looking at sort of the big picture of the full state when they discuss their budgetary needs and their school needs. And even with all of this increased spending and all of this, if you, I have not been to a public school in Vermont that felt like it was swimming in money. My public school is still quite strapped down in Brattleboro. Um, I'm Emily Kornheiser, state representative from Brattleboro um, and really glad to be here with all of you. So, however, because each district in Vermont, because of you know legislation that we passed in the 90s, Act 60 and Act 68 that followed it, we each individually decide on our budgets in collaboration with our school boards and our school administration and our voters. But the costs of all of those budgets all get added together and essentially handed to the legislature to fund in full. So we have these locally made separate decisions that are all collected together and then funded out of one education fund at the state level. And we have an obligation as legislators to fully fund that education fund. That's how it's set up. That's sort of the promise that was made 30 years ago when we passed that legislation. And so we started the legislative year aware of this sort of enormous impact on communities. And I wanna be clear, I don't think either of us are here to defend the tax rate. Um, it is absolutely an unacceptable leap from one year to another. Even for those folks who can most afford it, no one does financial planning with that kind of big jump from year to year. What we're here to do is explain what happened um, and why we couldn't temper it further. So we have this sum of all of these budgets that are all result of very reasonable increased needs at every single school district. And we have this education fund that is designed to self-balance, meaning no matter how much money is needed in the fund, the property taxes are the tool that change every year. The property tax rate changes every year in order to keep the fund full enough to fund all of those individually voted budgets. There's other money that goes into the fund. Um, our meals and rooms tax, our sales tax, um, a few other things. And that money that goes into the fund in pandemic years was also extra flush. So we had that federal money that Peter mentioned that went to the schools directly. 
But I don't know if you all remember, people were just spending a lot of money during the pandemic because really we just like couldn't find fun other ways. And we all, you know, federal money was flowing around. People had some extra cash. And so people were spending a lot, actually more money on consumables. And so the state got the sales tax and the meals and rooms tax from all of that spending we all did. And so the fund actually had extra money in it during those years. And that extra money was able to offset the property taxes and keep our rates low. And so everything I'm going to be talking about tonight is a very basic algebra problem of we have the sum of all of the budgets, we have this other revenue, and then we have the property taxes that are used to sort of fill that sum. And so basically any questions I answer, I'm just going to be going back to that basic algebra problem, which is hard to use without a whiteboard. So I'm just going to use my hands awkwardly like this the whole way. So we had this challenge to solve of we have this sum, we have less revenues, other revenues coming into the education fund. And so what we have left is property taxes as our lever. We knew that they were likely going to be higher than we thought was appropriate for Vermonters to withstand in a single year. And yes, we have mechanisms in Vermont's property tax system to take care of those who are least able to pay. So for folks who make around less than $100,000 a year and have house sites that are valued at less than $400,000 a year, people pay their taxes based on their income rather than on their property. But those, for those folks, the taxes were going up quite a lot too. I, for instance, pay based on income and my property taxes jumped a lot this year. And so this is a challenge for everyone. And we really did our best to figure it out. One of the things that I think is going to come up over and over again as we talk through this is the timeline that we are dealing with. So our legislative session started in January. At that point, most school boards had already finalized their budgets and were coming close to even warning them, right? There's that sort of long warning period before the vote. They were coming close to warning them. They had had months and months and months of deliberations. We are receiving them and then we set the rates. And so at that point, we don't have that many opportunities to change that sum that is needed. And so our chances of lowering property taxes are really just finding other taxes in order to fill, finding money from other places that are already probably spoken for, like our designated agencies or to pay for housing or directions or whatever it is, um, or to raise other taxes. And so we did a combination of things. What we wound up doing was raising some other taxes, but a lot of taxes can't even be raised in the year, a single year. And so we did the very best we could to pick a tax package that was as progressive as possible. And we wound up with a property tax rate that is much higher than really any state um, should have. And we're going to keep on working on it. So I'm, just a few points. Yeah. Right. So the education budget, according to the fiscal facts published by the Joint Fiscal Office, is $2.3 billion. Mm -hmm. Sound about right? Sure. Okay. So the net property tax is coming from primary residential. It's not that. It's homestead, right? It's not. Okay. It's homestead is 27% mm -hmm. after taking out the uh, adjustment for income sensitivity. Uh, and then on non-resident, non-primary home is 40%. So... 67, I've heard of 65, 67% of the education fund is coming from property taxes. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions. In Woodstock and in surrounding towns, the property tax rate for non-primary homeowners mm -hmm. is lower than it is for primary homeowners, mm -hmm. as it is in about 80 communities across the state. So there's a lot of angst of that, obviously. Mm -hmm. So is that, do you see that continuing that way in the legislature? Is there an opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute, the second homeowners in particular mm -hmm. should be paying the same as what primary homeowners pay? So the, we have two property tax rates. We have the homestead rate and the non-homestead rate. The non-homestead rate is not just second homes. It includes commercial properties. It includes farms. It includes parking lots. It includes affordable housing. It includes market rate um, rentals. It's really just anything that's not the homestead and two acres. And so it's a very, very broad category. 
And it's set at the same rate for every single non-homestead property in the state. And so a community where the homestead rate, the rate for folks who are living in their homes, is higher than the non-homestead rate is just half of the communities in the whole state where they pay higher, where you have a per pupil spending that is higher than the average per pupil spending. And um, communities that their non-homestead rate is lower than the homestead rate is just the half of communities that have um, that are lower pure pupil spending than the average per pupil spending. So the non-homestead rates, the same for absolutely everyone. Homestead rates vary depending on how much you your district is spending per pupil. And so you wind up above if you wind up spending more than average and you wind up below if you spend less than average. That is not intuitive to anyone, is it? Is that intuitive to anyone in this room? In fact, did anyone even understand anything I said? I have no idea. Okay. But, um, Part of it is just the terminology, non-homestead sounds really close to like second home or vacation home, right? Um, and we have been talking for a long time about something we can do about it. Right now, um, in order to do that, we would need sort of a mechanism to do that. We have no way of knowing in our grand lists really, um, how every grand list in the state, which sort of talks about the use of a property, is managed at the town level. And there's a lot of discrepancy between definitions because it's a town level definition. And so in order for us to be able to tax properties based on their use rather than their description at point of sale, we would need to rewrite, probably need to rewrite every grand list in the state. We have actually started that process, um, but it is a very slow process and it's gonna be administratively complicated. Um, sort of slightly separate from all of this, we have a reappraisal firm shortage in Vermont. I know that you all are sort of behind on your reappraisal. You're planning on getting one. Um, reappraising at the town level is very, very inefficient and also not very equitable. Um, and so, we're hoping, I'm hoping, I don't know who the we is in that, I'm hoping that as we rewrite the way we do reappraisals in Vermont, we can begin to create a grand list that is more uniform and more discerning so we can start to break up those non-homestead property tax categories in order to tax in a way that is more intuitive to people that's based on how the property is used rather than just these two categories. But it's an administrate. It's administratively complex. Should we talk about the uh, common level of appraisal now, or just wait until? I think we can wait until someone asks a question. Yeah. Uh, all right. So <laughs> there will be. I'm sure there will be one. Well, it, it was interesting in a Valley News editorial back in March. They did two editorials on education financing, and one called the education financing system mind-numbingly complex. And I think we're getting into that, and that's one of the things that they cited as saying we need to change this. Um, and then they came out with a, a few different things about the state government should have a much bigger say in the total amount of school spending. Uh, it would include effective disincentives for districts to spend in excess of the threshold amount. The consequences of local spending decisions would be simple to understand and predictable and would be based straightforwardly on ability to pay. So we, we have people here that have lived in their home for 30 years, I'm going to say. Um, could verify that later. So they bought their house, made improvements, market appreciated, and now you're talking about income tax or property taxes are $30,000, they're retired. Um, their income is $65,000. Maximum adjustment is $8,000. So they're left with a $22,000 property tax bill. So, so that leads you to what else can we do? So that puts pressure on short-term rentals. So talking about how do you make the system more income based instead of on property value based. So there's an interesting, I don't know if it's interesting to any, there's a truism in tax policy that um, equity and simplicity are in constant tension to each other. Um, and so in order to have an equitable tax system, you often need to make it much more complex. 
when we add in local control as sort of the third leg in that diagram, the complexity gets both totally out of control. And I think a lot of people assume that in order to have local decision making, we need enough simplicity for people to be able to talk about it at town meeting in a functional way. I um, will confess that even though I'm the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, I got a um, delay in my income taxes this year. And they were due on October 15th, you know, six months later. And I signed them on the last possible day I could on October 15th. And as I am, I don't do them myself. I have an accountant do them. I don't even like have very complex taxes. It's just sort of overwhelming to me. And as I am scanning through all of these tax documents, as the chair of Ways and Means, who's been doing this for a little while, I'm like, this is unbelievably complex and mostly incomprehensible. And so I think it's interesting that we all have this assumption that this particular tax system should be comprehensible to us, um, that we should be able to describe why our bill is exactly this in two minutes or less without a whiteboard, when none of us have that expectation of income taxes. And I think it is because, um, and I don't want to get too philosophical about this, it's the local decision making. Hmm. And so I think it's a question for everyone here and for every Vermonter, if we do want to put more limits on spending, or if we want to put more structures around quality, and we want a system that's equitable, are we willing and interested in releasing from some degree of local control of budgets. And that's not necessarily my decision to make. That's something that Vermonters need to figure out for themselves. But we can't actually have it all. And I guess I would add, um, we can talk about sort of how we pay for schools, but we also need to be talking about how much we spend on schools and education in Vermont. When we talk about $2.4 billion, that's for 80,000 kids. That's a that's a ratio that you don't find in many other states uh, in our country. And we, we are now really starting to feel what that means. Uh, as Emily said, we, there's been a number of sort of economic things that have happened that have cushioned us from the impact of that. When when we had the when we first started using the sales tax, for example, in in calculating how it would work in the overall education fund, all of a sudden the Supreme Court um, uh, of the United States had the Wayfair decision, which meant we could tax sales on the internet. That was a huge amount of money that was not budgeted for that poured into the education fund that once again helped keep tax rates down, but it didn't necessarily have any control over spending. So again, it's a big number, but it is, as Emily said, going to require us as Vermonters to say, what does our, what, what do we value? What can we live without in terms of how we've always done education versus how we're going to need to do it in the future in order to, to um, spend at a reasonable level that doesn't pr produce these sorts of shocks. So in your general road and pony show, <clears throat> You know what I mean? Dog yep. pony. Thank you. Um, so is, I, I like, am I the pony and he's the dog? I've never understood how that metaphor works. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but just for those uh, that are here, it's interesting to know we have 36 people online as well. So um, so it's a well attended event. Thank you. It points out to the interest. Um, there's a, there's a lot to cover and I'm not sure we have enough time. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. And then we're going to take those questions from the audience. Um, and then if you have some questions that you've written out, uh, Martha Giller, who is a, a staunch community member, retired teacher, um, and she's going to collect your questions and then we'll bring them up. Um, okay. So there's been a lot of reports lately, right? So the, the Pikus and Auden report, uh, just said you don't need to spend as much money as you're spending somewhere between 400 and 460 million. Uh, a few years ago, they said you don't have to spend that much. When it was one and a half million, you're spending like 160 million too much. Uh, they've been advising Vermont for 12 years at least. Anyway, uh, the first report back in 2012. So are they right? I mean, what's so the re the report. Um, the headline of the report had a second half to your sentence yes, that you did. left out. And it's that 
if we structured our education system in the very particular way that this academic model describes, and it is, it's an academic model that looks at quality and cost. If we structured our system this very particular way, we could both spend less money and have much higher quality. But it didn't account for well, and I'll, I'll start there. So this is a report that just came out recently. Um, it's very, very recent headlines that said if we did structure our education system in a certain way, we really shouldn't need to spend as much as we are by $400 million. The the big caveat and the, and the folks who wrote the report put this caveat throughout the report. Bold, in bold. In bold, is that it does not account for the scale at which we educate in Vermont. In other words, we have... Many small schools, um, it, it envisions high schools of at least 600 kids. That is, you know, in the rural parts of the state, that is not necessarily the norm. Um, it envisions, you know, one principal for every 450 kids. Well, I can tell you in the district where I live, we have seven principals for about that because we operate seven different elementary schools. Uh, so we operate differently in Vermont, and it's something that Vermonters have time and time again said that this is we value this, but this report makes very clear we are also paying for that. Uh, yes, there was a concept of a, a hub school that was thrown up. Maybe that's uh, later on. Never mind. We'll get to that. Uh, as to what that really means, what is a hub school? Uh, there was also another report. It was a tax structure commission back in 2021 that wanted to establish an education tax advisory committee, but also said, eliminate the property tax credit, eliminate the homestead education tax, and then implement income-based education tax, levy non-homestead tax on all property except house sites, and create a renter credit. Is that DOA? Is that still in conversations? So we, it certainly comes up very regularly. And whenever it comes up, especially with fellow legislators, I point them to a really fabulous other report that um, of a task force that Peter and I were on together, um, that it was a task force in implementing an income-based education tax. And there are a few reasons why sort of at the end of the day, I think we didn't move forward after that task force's work. One was the actual logistics of implementing something like that in a system of local control where every district's budget is separate and then is summed up. So the total needed is very um, unpredictable. The implementation challenges of an income-based tax were, um, we weren't ever able to resolve them. The other thing is that there are quite a few Vermonters um, and more and more every year, every decade who are retired um, or who do not, for other reasons, have a regular income. And so we would we would be leaving a lot of our tax base behind in a state that we already know demographically is going to be moving, continue to move in that particular direction. Um, so it's risky from a tax policy perspective to like shift to a shrinking base um, because it would put more of the responsibility on the younger working families that already are feeling such the a lot of crush of other financial responsibilities. Okay, great. I want to go to uh, school, new school construction. Um, and you, you serve on the task force for aid to school construction. Uh, I don't. That was a um, oh. was a one year task force. Uh, however, um, I let me let me provide the update when it comes to school to construction. You talk. I'm going to walk. Okay, great. Uh, so, the state of Vermont has not had used to provide up to 30% toward a major school construction project for allowable expenses. Um, most of those expenses were allowed. Uh, that, that program essentially maxed out quickly because it required state bonding and state repayment of those bonds. And we sort of hit a limit and we continue to be paying off those bonds. But it, it, it essentially came to an end in 2008. The state had sort of hit its credit limit. The, since then, it has become abundantly clear that we have a, a rapidly aging infrastructure, that we have frankly deferred maintenance on year after year after year, 
because school boards in trying to be as conservative as possible in trying to provide the best opportunities for education for kids have generally said, you know, we can go another year without that boiler, but we can't go another year without our math enrichment. Uh, very responsible decisions, but but we are now, the chickens are coming home to roost. We commissioned a study of all of our school buildings, and uh, you probably have seen the reports. The, the um, level of deferred maintenance is staggering. Um, it's it's in well into the hundreds of millions towards a, a billion or so dollars. Uh, you folks in Woodstock are living this right now. There is no question about that. So how do we handle that? So we are looking at how we can restart this program in a sustainable way that um, can provide some amount of aid to schools in areas um, that are, are vital to, to having that happen. But we're also at an inflection point with our entire education system because we now know just how expensive it is. So we wanna make sure that that aid that goes out is done in a smart and strategic way. So there's currently a, a group of legislators that are meeting on a every few week basis right now so that in January when we come back, we will have a piece of legislation that will outline a program that um, that will move to a model where we can hopefully restart that, but restart it in a way that meets longer term strategic goals. So that might mean if you're operating a 40 student elementary school that is six miles from another one that could easily accommodate those students and you want to bond for both of those schools, maybe not. Maybe you don't get a state incentive. But if you are, you know, going the route of newer and fewer and building for the future and looking at our demographics and planning that way, maybe that's, you know, eligible for something else. It, the What is currently being discussed is sort of modeled after uh, what they use in Rhode Island, um, but it's going to require uh, some sort of dedicated revenue source because the idea is, is that Woodstock would go out for a bond. If it qualified for 20% incentive, the state would contribute not just a lump sum of 20% of your total cost, but 20% annually toward your bond payments. It's a much more sustainable way they could keep sort of revolving and revolving as certain bonds get paid off and more come online. Um, but we want to make sure we do it in a smart and strategic way, but we also want to make sure we do it. Uh, it is it is high time that this returned. We um, are having, you know, it, we are a state with great need and um, it's been, it's with the cost of what it takes to, to do any work, it, it really can't be done necessarily at a, at a one-time only local basis. Although, as we all know, we have a statewide education fund, it's not necessarily all local. Um, before we go to we, questions, can I feel like I never told the end of the story about what happened with our taxes this year. Can I just take one minute to do that? That sounds like fun. Okay. And can you incorporate the governor's veto on what, what it would have meant if the veto had not been overridden? Sure. Um, so we had this large sum of money we needed to raise. We knew that the property taxes to raise that sum of money would be very hard for Vermonters. And so we made a few decisions um, that were possible that would also fully fund the voted budgets of schools. And I just want to say, we have not talked about like how much we care about kids and how vital schools are to democracy and how teachers and who anyone who works in schools is like an absolute champion of the world and I could never do it because we're here to talk about money and taxes tonight but I just want to like make sure that we're clear that Vermont is a state that has always deeply valued public education that our kids are our future all of those nice things with the unicorns and the bunnies okay so um we wanted to lower those property taxes as much as possible, and we wanted to protect those Vermonters that were least able to pay. And so we did a few things. We passed a um, increase in the tax that folks who are purchasing services at a short-term rental would pay. Um, and so that's customers coming in. We set that at a rate that was considered not elastic meaning it was a rate that would not change consumer behavior. 
um, we set it low enough so it would not upset consumer behavior. There might be a lot of good reasons to upset short-term rental consumer behavior, but that was like, we didn't have time to have that policy conversation. And so we didn't. If anyone wants to have that conversation later, I'm happy to. Ooh. All right, you open that door. Yeah, later. I don't mean like here in the whole room, but later. Yeah. Um, we repealed a longstanding exemption in the sales tax that was meant as a very short-term um, sort of kickstart to an industry and had just sort of like lasted past its point, And that was to cloud-based services. It was just an exemption of the sales tax that we repealed. Um, and then because folks who pay on income who get the property tax credit are on a year delay for that credit, we increased the percentage of the credit that they were getting this year in order to account for the increased bill. Um, so those are the big changes we made. In doing all of those things, we were able to, and then we also put some one-time money um, from the general fund into um, the education fund. And so in doing all of those things together, we were able to lower the average tax bill from a 20% increase down to like a 13% increase. Again, still too high, but the absolute best that we could do given the circumstances available to us. We also then um, did not wanna be in the same situation this coming year. And so we reinstated the longstanding excess spending threshold. That was a policy tool we used for a very long time in Vermont. Um, we put that back in place. And given that there are so many of the decisions that we've talked about that Vermonters really need to be make, making about the future of public education, we created the Commission on the Future of Public Education, which is a two-year process um, to really figure out what are our priorities and how do we want to shape policy, fiscal policy, but also educational policy to meet those goals. And what would have happened if the governor's veto had been sustained? So the governor vetoed the bill. And um, I understand looking at a bill like that and say, looking at a tax bill like that, not looking at a legislative bill like that and saying like, oh no, those taxes are too high. I don't want to vote for that. Um, but in not voting for it, if we had not had a yield bill, if a yield bill had never passed, we would have um, gone to sort of a default section of statute. Um, and it's a default section of statute that I don't know if we've ever gone to, um, but it would have increased the non-homestead rate through like a bunch of math in that default statute. The non-homestead rate would have increased by 30%, um, which, you know, given our housing crisis is certainly not something we want happening to rental properties particularly. We still have a lot of commercial properties that are struggling to move out of the pandemic times, all those things. No one wants that. Um, and we also would have not been able to fully fund our public education system. We would have had to dip into our reserves. We would have had to dip deeper into our reserves than our reserves exist are. Um, and that would have also created a even larger hole for the next year. So we... Um, overrode the veto so that we could fund our schools. Great, thank you. Uh, so oh, we're going to go to questions unless you want to ask some right. questions. And I have questions that are received by email, and so I'm going to alternate phone and a phone. Right. Okay. So uh, one person wrote in and really liked how Hawaii decides how it's going to fund education. Oh. Yeah. Uh, in the weeds. And it was based on that the state decides what is based on a yearly evaluation, what it would cost to educate a student, and they send that money to the school district, and if the school district wants to spend more, then they have to raise it through some other means, not by taxes. Thoughts? I, I would say that, you know, this is a, a, a concept, and uh, it's not, it's a lot more than a concept. Most states do it this way. But that's a, that's the, the fact of the matter, is that they, they have a, an education budget. The state says, you're all going to get uh, $8,000 per student. Um, and frankly, most places, that's what they get, and they don't have that ability to necessarily raise uh, locally as well. Uh, I think it is it is something that we are going to have to talk about in Vermont. I think that it is, um, you know, where you but it is where you basically say to a district, here is your allotment, and then you manage to the dollars that you receive. Uh, you know, depending on what that is set at. In, in many ways, it actually takes a lot of pressure off of school boards and, and the people who run schools because their job is no longer to decide what's the right amount. It is to 
do their best and think strategically about how they manage to the money. Now, if you're talking about a huge decrease in how much every school is going to receive, that's pretty painful. Uh, the other side of that is, and then they can raise any more they want to raise locally. That's where things get a little tricky. The Brigham decision, the Supreme Court decision that led to Act 60, basically makes that very difficult because it is, it is saying, well, a Killington with its uh, many, many, many second homes could raise a lot more money locally than Whiting, which was the town that was that led to the Brigham decision, um, because they just simply don't have that tax base. So that's the, that the other end of that equation is where it gets tricky in Vermont and how you can how you do that equitably. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, that we can't do it. It's just figuring out how to do it equitably. And Hawaii is a really great example. So almost every state um, does something like this straightforward payment from the state to the districts. Um, Hawaii has, you know, a bunch of islands and has remarkably few school districts. They even have one school district that would cover multiple islands. They also um, have multiple categories of property taxation. Um, including a specific property tax category for second homes. Um, and as Peter said, it comes back to, do we want to move to a system where school boards and voters are focused on how to spend the money they have rather than on how to persuade voters about how much they need to raise? And that again, like that's a decision for Vermonters to make. Right. I mean, this this will this is the tension that we are going to continue to face between local control. Right now, you decide what your budget should be and how much to spend, or the removal of some of that local control where the state says this is how much you get. You get to decide how to manage to those those dollars. And I just want to um, I, to sort of place us in a statewide context a little bit. Um, there are districts in the state that are able to, through like really difficult conversations with their voters, like here or in Brattleboro, pass their school budgets and fund their schools the way that they think is um, good enough, maybe even wonderful. And there are some districts in our state that are profoundly underfunding their schools. And I don't want us to lose track of those kids in those schools when we're talking about all of this money that we're spending as a total of a state, because the system we have now is actually still not equitable for kids. There are some kids who are really having like profoundly underfunded educations in our existing system. Uh, I'll just provide an example. Um, I'm in the Addison Central School District. I think we spend about $23,000 a student. Our school budget passed two to one in March. Our neighboring school district around Fairhaven, uh, it took, I think, five votes. And I think that they spend on average between fourteen and $16,000 per student. And it, a lot of it just comes down to the willingness of the, of the people in that district to vote a larger budget. And just for, uh, because you brought up the dollar amount, the average spending per pupil is what, 23,700, something like that. But it's really hard to know because there's long-term weighted average, there's long-term average daily membership. It's like, okay, is there a number that you can say? I don't know that number off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Sorry. I don't even think Julia knows that number off the top of her head. So uh, a question is, why does the, I hate to ask this question, why does the education fund get used for TIF districts and current use? Oh. Um, I love that question. Oh yeah, Charlie. Do do? Yeah. Charlie and I sat next to each other in committee for a couple of years and had some really good disagreements. We did have some tips. We've had a lot of tips over tips. Um, so property taxes you are explain what a tip district. I will. Yes. Property taxes fund education, right? That's the deal. Um, and how you tax property is incredibly complicated. And so we have certain ways we change the way that we tax property or that change the way we value property in order to make sure that land can still be used in the way we want it to be used. And so current use is one way we say the value to our community from land being used for farming or forestry or for um, vulnerable and special ecosystems is 
more important than say the market value of the taxation of that land. And that's a really sort of important way that Vermont has managed to keep the landscape that it has. There are big questions about like the exact shape of current use, who benefits from current use right now, um, how that benefit shakes out, whether folks should be able to post land that's in current use, all kinds of questions like that that we probably can't get into today. Um, TIFs are in some ways similar to that, um, but way more mathematically complicated and um, only and available in way fewer communities. So there's land in current use in almost every community in Vermont. TIFs are a way of artificially lowering the property value in a very certain section of a community in order for that community to spend the difference between the market rate of that property value and the sort of frozen rate of that property value. Frozen and to use frozen. and to use that difference between the two um, for investments. There are very few communities in Vermont that have sort of the organizational prowess and administrative prowess um, and a need for that kind of sort of infrastructure money like that, um, or, and um, communities where the difference between a frozen value and a future value would actually be big enough to actually use that money for anything at all, right? Like if you did some, a little bit of wastewater infrastructure in um, Pownal, likely the increased market value in that community would not actually grow enough that the difference between a frozen value and a new market value would like bring in enough money to pay your bond payments. So it's limited to very specific communities. Um, and so there's a lot of concern that money that the education fund is losing is benefiting some communities over others. It can be argued, I can even argue that like eight ways to Sunday, um, but it is a big question. And yeah. if we had a more nuanced property tax series of categories, we would be able to tax based on use in a much more nuanced way. And I think some of the vigor over the TIF arguments would fade. But so TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing District is highly complex and complicated, but the actual impact on the education fund is only about $8 million a year. Mm -hmm. So $8 million is part of 200 and I'm sorry, was it 1.2.4? 2.4 billion dollars. Uh, seems like it's not that significant. But, so that's why Emily and I may not agree on some things. Uh, so in our district, school spending increased about 11% from 23 to 24. Yet property taxes in our towns went up 30% on average. What accounts for this difference and where did all the surplus money go? The money that we spend in Vermont is raised from every property taxpayer in the whole state and then distributed to communities and your rate is set in relationship to your spending per pupil but is not a direct one-to-one -one correlation and so if every district but yours increases their spending by 23 percent and you only increase your spending by 12 percent that doesn't mean that your tax rate is going to increase by 12 percent your tax rate is still going to need to increase a little bit more because the full amount of money raised by the pot um, needs to increase. There's also a whole system of how we weight pupils, and the weighting of pupils is how we count the number of students that we figure out for per pupil counts, and that also um, accounts for how tax responsibility is distributed from town to town. But I feel like it's more complicated than it needs to be. And we don't need to get into that unless someone really wants to. So, Emily, uh, I often tell people that Thanks. previous to, no, this is a question for oh, you. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> really previous to this year, the correlation between your spending and your tax rate increase was better aligned. It's not a hundred, it's not a one to one, never has been since Act 60, but that the that the overall spending increase across the state, because it was so unprecedented, sort of threw that relationship out of whack. Mm -hmm. There are a few, so the huge spike threw it out of whack. Um, the big drop in other revenue going into the education fund threw it out of whack, probably in equal measure. And then we also did change the way we count kids. 
Um, and the way we're counting kids also created more extreme differences from district to district. So now with this waiting, mm -hmm. we've got about 83,000 pupils in the system, including adult education. But with the weighted, it's about 140,000. Mm -hmm. So the big difference. Sure. Okay. Um, so this is a question about the school. Uh, and thank you, Jess, for the question. Have any of you toured WHS, and do you feel the condition of the building is conducive to learning and teaching? So uh, as you know, there was a, an assessment done in 2023 of facilities condition index, uh, where the main structure is at 61%, and the, uh, the newer structure is actually worse at 65%. Uh, but in February, the school district did receive the approval from the Agency of Education saying it was a memorandum of preliminary approval for school construction. So if there was ever aid to school construction, even if the school project started before that money was available, it would be available down the road. So I'm going to answer your question first, Jess, by saying, uh, well, when I graduated from that school in 82, it wasn't much different or than when my three kids graduated from that school, it wasn't much different than it is now, except for the library. It's a much nicer library now. Um, so it's it's pretty much the same uh, as it was. I remember playing soccer in the uh, middle school gym probably about 15 years ago and having the tiles kind of fall down. Uh, so that was, it's it's been an issue. Um, so anyway, I've been in there uh, certainly a lot. And I think, Peter, you had the uh, uh, turned it into I have not been inside, no. Okay. Yeah, and it's, is it the worst in the system? Condition-wise? Uh, I had heard that you're, in terms of FCI, you are second worst in the system. Second worst. Is the Kingdoms? I don't know who number one is. Oh. FCI Falls. Falls. Is it released condition index? Yes. Uh, we had a question, getting back to these questions. How are we doing? Everybody all right so far? All right. It's still interesting? We want to be interesting, if nothing else. Um, my understanding is that currently Vermont will not approve any new private schools. What is the plan of, if any, regarding private schools in Vermont? Is there any discussion of moving our socialized public system to a more open charter system with more options to private schools? Uh, so um, it, as, as passed in the budget of 2023, uh, a moratorium was imposed on the approval of any new independent schools. An approved independent school is one that is eligible to receive state tax tuition dollars. Uh, so if you were in a choice town, those tuition dollars can only go to an approved independent school or, or a public school. Uh, this moratorium was essentially put in place to get a, a sort of a handle on how does this parallel system with the public school system uh, affect overall spending, uh, affect tax rates, uh, and how does it sort of work together? Um, you know, in the old days, we kind of had four independent schools that served the purpose of public schools, and those are our four historic academies. In, I think, the 80s or the 90s, a, a, a statute was changed, and all of a sudden, we had a huge growth in independent schools that could receive public dollars. Um, you have them ranging from very small to uh, a, a bit larger. Um, some kids, you know, go to, uh, for example, Sharon Academy, that sort of came on during this wave of independent schools. And as we sort of have this debate about the fact that uh, a fair number, a fair bit of our tax dollars are funneled off to independent schools, uh, the, the sort of idea was let's stop and sort of get a, a feel, a better sense of how this approval system works. We're in the middle of um, some new approval rules uh, correct, surrounding if you receive taxpayer dollars for tuition, you also need to live up to the same obligations for special education. Those are sort of coming online and we wanted to make sure that, that we got those approvals cleared first. Uh, the future of all of that now sort of rests with the conversations going on with the Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont. That's one of its charges is to, is to discuss where do, uh, where, do, where do independent schools fit in, um, especially in those areas where choice has already um, been a longstanding uh, tradition. Might also mention the Supreme Court decision. Uh, yes, and there was also a, 
there was a Supreme Court decision, a U.S. Supreme Court decision that said that if your state provides tax dollars for independent schools, you cannot discriminate against religious schools. In other words, if it's an approved independent school that is religious, just no matter what their dogma is, uh, you cannot discriminate against holding money back from them. Though they can discriminate. Yes. They can discriminate, but we can't. Mm. And separation of church and state. Is so uh, Karen writes, uh, and I, I might not get the question right, but when we're talking about what value and what can we live without, and we're only talking about education, what about looking at the entire state budget? Uh, so the increase in school spending are largely uh, necessitated or supported uh, by what the voters do. I think um, Peter sort of foreshadowed this a little bit earlier. So we have these, we have desig one example of that is we have our designated mental health agencies that provide mental health services to our communities and um, are, have historically been available to provide mental health services in our schools. They experienced, um, they've been fairly underfunded for a long time, as are all of our contracted state services. Um, that are contracted through the general fund um, and ha experienced a hiring crisis along with you know many hiring crises. It's a very hard job. Um, and so school systems started hiring internal staff in order to meet those needs because schools are legally obligated under federal law to meet the needs of kids um, if those kids have a 504 or an IP, right? And so they need that staff. The schools were paying more than the designated mental health agencies that was funded out of the general fund. And so won the staffing fight. And this is all very reasonable, appropriate behavior, everyone trying to get their needs met. But what we wind up with is sort of a little bit of an internal arms race. And we have one fund that is sort of self-filling and has a federal obligation, and another fund that has limits on it and less of a federal obligation. And so we sort of wind up in the situation that we're in. The general fund is under intense pressures, though, every budget season, um, and there's not a lot of um, extra juice in there. And so when someone wants to move a cost from the education fund into the general fund, I generally ask them, what would you like us not to be funding in the general fund? Thank you. And I realize we have 15 minutes left and we're going to try to get through all the questions. If uh, Hang on. Do you have one written down? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll get there at the end. Uh, if you want. Uh, is everyone aware of the petition from district residents to reinstate school construction fund? Please see Brittany. Yes. Uh, so it was on the list sir, this morning and it's, uh, there isn't a petition for people to sign to urge legislators to reinstate state aid for education. And Tesha Bus sent it to Peter and I. Ah, there you go. Um, gonna continue Fast to work. Collect more. I was gonna give one to Charlie. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. I think we. Um, I don't know if every legislator agrees, but I think Peter and I agree that we need to do something about school construction very much. And that this community is one of the first that would need to see the impacts of that. How we do it is um, pretty hard to figure out because we're going to need to find money for it. Okay. Um, let's talk about the Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont. So it was established in the legislation that you mentioned, Emily. Uh, Peter, you're on that. Emily, the chair of the Education uh, Subcommittee on the Education Financing. So it's a huge task. Right. Yes. Figure out how many schools to have. Uh, what's ideal there? What role does the school do schools play in the community? Uh, is it should they have wraparound services for all the students? Is it really just education? Um, so can you talk about what you where you are now and how far you've got to go? Uh, we've got a long way to go. We're really in our initial stages. We have a our first public hearing uh, on Monday, and it's also Preceding that, uh, we have an all-day meeting to really start getting into the nuts and bolts. The purpose of this commission was to bring together 
people from all parts of our um, sort of education system in Vermont and talk about what should Vermont's education system look like. The fact is, is nobody out there wants to go through what we went through in 2024 with the budget defeats, the anger that persists over the cost of education. And I think many people, myself included very much, see this as our opportunity to say, okay, people are ready for change. People are ready to have very hard conversations about things like, do we need as many schools as we operate? And we need to capitalize on that and, and bring people together and say, okay, what are those what are those major issues? What is the question we need to put before Vermonters? Uh, and how do we create a system that meets the needs, that exceeds the needs, as far as I'm concerned, of kids in Vermont in a way that is still affordable to um, Vermonters? We're going to have the same conversation when it comes to health care, not we, this commission, but Vermont is, where we operate lots of small hospitals. It's very expensive. It's the way we've done things. We don't necessarily want to lose that. So how do we find what we what we hold sort of dear compared to what it is we can afford to do? And at all times, keeping in the center of that, the education of children, as opposed to the other things that kind of go along with having a school in your community or providing um, the, the broad richness of things that we offer our students in Vermont. Uh, so that's its task. Uh, and, you know, as a politician, I sort of look at it a little bit like providing cover rather than the legislature saying, this is the way we think it should be. It's an ability to say, you know, we got everybody together and these are the areas where we agreed Let's move forward. Let's let's make those changes that we need to have an affordable but still high quality education system. I, I applaud you for the work you're doing, but I want to push back on one thing. Act 46 was supposed to, by consolidation of school districts, potentially lower our costs of operating, um, bringing together into a, things into a central office, and improve outcomes. But the result seems to be mixed. So there's a lot of. I was not thankfully, in the legislature during Act 46, and I'm grateful for that. None of us were. So we didn't oh, know. you weren't? No, no. Oh, I thought that was your year. No. Yeah, no. Only Allison. Um, I think what's really interesting, and there's sort of um, one of, I know there's like a lot of talk about how we study things to death, but the amount that we don't know about our education spending, um, given the Agency of Education's really very limited capacity over the last few years, um, is quite stunning. And one piece of that is that we have been waiting on reports about sort of the efficacy of Act 46 from the Agency of Education for a long time. Um, sort of embarrassingly, it's become a joke between Peter and I to sort of take turns asking the agency for it. Um, but what we have learned from a college student who did a graduate who did a graduate thesis at what is it Harvard? I don't know who saw this article. Um, and more and some people have looked at this undergraduate thesis, but I think it's an interesting idea that instinctually holds true for me. So I'm now going to perpetuate this undergraduate thesis story. <laughs> um, spending did go down, efficiencies were found, but districts still spent the same amount of money. They just spent the money on other things. And what we've seen with local control of budgets is that districts tend to spend the amount they spend because they think that's what their voters will bear. And so generally school spending in Vermont, when we try to correlate it with almost anything, and I have had our joint fiscal office run this correlation quite a few different ways, school spending tends to relate to nothing other than what schools have spent in the past. It's not, um, it's not necessarily even related to sort of the political makeup of community. It's not related to the demographics of that community, it's which you would think would relate to student need. It really seems to be sort of the patterns and rhythms that that district is in. And so Act 46 might have accomplished everything we wanted, except for the fact that districts then, you know, applied that money to other places. Does the current I, district accept it, of course? Of course, yes. yes. I, there's another example of a place that we tried to address this, which is Act 173, and I think it's a really important lesson for us as we tackle these next problems. 
and Peter can say way more than I have. I just want to sort of set it up if you're interested. Um, so we knew that we were both spending too much money on special education and not providing quality special education in the state of Vermont. And so we passed us a law, Act 173, that would move us to a block grant system um, that should spend less money and um, it's census-based block for whatever that's worth and a whole bunch of programmatic changes in order to increase the quality of special education delivered to Vermont kids. It was supposed to be like a lot more of um, sort of like upstream intervention kind of stuff. The implementation side of 173 the programmatic implementation from the Agency of Education didn't really happen the way it was envisioned in statute, but the financial changes did happen. And so because fiscal changes happened and programmatic changes didn't simultaneously, though they were envisioned to happen simultaneously, we right now have a system where special education costs, special education is still being delivered in the same way that is not necessarily meeting students' needs as best as they can. And special education costs are now just being funneled into other areas um, outside of that census based block grant. So special education costs are still skyrocketing. They're just being carried in different line items. And so we created a weird perverse incentive accidentally because policy implementation and fiscal implementation were not moving hand in hand. And for me, that's like one of the greatest lessons I'm going to take into this next chapter of our work together. Do you know? Yeah, that was kind of very well explained. Because I've heard you explain it 50 times. <laughs> um, so we still have a bunch of questions, but we've got maybe seven minutes left. Um, do you want us to try to do like three words for each question or? Sure. Uh, that right, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick. What is the least aggressive form of taxation? Property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes? Income taxes. Least regressive? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most progressive. I thought you said sales taxes. I yep. said income taxes. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, there seem to be many opportunities to centralize functions to the benefit of the state regarding health care insurance, purchasing of some uh, some money. We passed a bill called BOCES that's supposed to start that process. Okay. Thank you. Like New York. Why is there a hodgepodge of real estate qualifications for non-homestead properties? I think I explained that one earlier. All done locally, right? Uh, okay. We had a question from someone who's talking about real estate taxes and what was, uh, if you're building rental properties, as to having a cap on the taxes on a particular rental property, if it's rented to primary residents, um, as exists in Massachusetts, the writer submits. So local municipalities can actually freeze property tax rates um, for a specific property anytime they want. Um, a lot of farms have sort of frozen property taxes at the community level, but a community could do that for any property they want. In If you would like to do that in the meantime, while we do this work of dividing up um, property tax categories. That then is borne by the rest of the property. It is borne by the rest of the property taxpayers. Anything we do to limit property taxes for one population will be borne by the rest of the property taxpayers. It is a balloon that if you squeeze it at one place, it's gonna move over to another spot. Uh, no, I'm not gonna ask that one. Uh, let's see, how do, you Allison's question. How, how do you control healthcare costs, especially if patient outcomes are so poor? This is the other big conversation we're gonna have to have in Vermont in the next couple of years. Um, our healthcare costs are, I mean, education and healthcare right now are on these very similar parallel tracks. And a lot of it comes down to our demographics. Uh, we have a declining enrollment in our, in our student body. Um, and we have an increased enrollment in our healthcare needs because of an aging uh, population. Uh, so, you know, to, I can't remember the original part of the question, but, but how we can provide Basically, the hospital system is going to have start having the same conversation that the education system is going to have. How do we deliver high quality output for the amount of money going into it and make it affordable? It's going to require the same hard decisions. Can we have a full service, 14 
full service hospitals around the state and be able to afford that? I think clearly the answer is no, but can we let go of, of demanding that uh, for all of us? And question. if you wanna know about lowering school healthcare costs, what is the bargaining group called? Uh, well, so we start, currently, we currently have a, a um, statewide uh, contract for healthcare. It is negotiated every few years. What's um, the group that does that called? Uh, uh, it's it's the commission on um, so public this, employee health care. The commission on public employee health care is digging into this exact issue. They actually um, froze their existing nego their existing bargain in order to spend two years together figuring out how they can lower costs across the board rather than continuing to just argue about who should bear the responsibility for those costs. And so, if anyone wants to follow those conversations, it would probably help if we actually knew what it was called, but we don't. So I'm gonna. And with one last question, which is always comes up whenever we're talking about financing new schools locally. And that is the old concept of how much tax money we send in from the community in terms of property taxes and how much comes back. So it lowers the capacity of the community to then shoulder a bond. Uh, at the same time, we've got other capital projects in the community. So it, it is the old thinking about how education taxes work and funding just local projects instead of going to a statewide education property tax how would you how do you answer that question when somebody asks you this is not how our education fund is set up anymore and our education fund hasn't been set up that way for 20 something years um everyone pays in everyone gets out it's not that you're paying extra in or um, receiving extra it's just everyone pays in everyone gets from it um Vermont gets more from the feds than we pay in. I know that um, about our, you know, taxes as a whole in the state of Vermont. Um, and I think it's really important for any of these conversations for us to remember that the kids in the town next door are our kids too. Um, it's a very small state. And I think you want your neighbor's kids to be educated as well as your kids are. And that's going to take all of us pitching in to make a difference to support teachers, support schools, and to pay our taxes. I would just add that uh, it isn't, we haven't done it that, that way for 20 plus years. It just feels that way because we still use the same system. But the state essentially has your town clerk collect taxes on its behalf. It's, they're really just acting as an agent of the state to collect the money, and then it all goes into the education fund together, and then is then paid out based on our, our complex formula. So we're going to end it there, but um, will you be around for like five, ten minutes mm -hmm. all right, uh, to answer some of those questions? And I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. I'm sorry about that, but an hour and a half, this is a very complex issue. If you have anything that you want to ask some of the uh, Emily or Peter, my email is on the listserv all the time. Uh, just send me an email and I'll get that question to the right place or even direct you to the right website that has that information so you can download it. There's some Okay. I and there's so many very Congress about that. And there's an important deadline you mentioned January. Uh, and there's a recommendation we have a comment before we find a date for construction. Yeah, that, that recommendation should be made by your task force, right? Uh, well, it'll be coming from Emily's subcommittee. Yeah. So the school construction will actually come from the school construction task force, and that will happen. Um, they're doing their work right now. Um, I really would encourage you, we actually don't have gold towns anymore. I'd really encourage you to release yourself from thinking of your community that way um what? thinking of your community in that way um i you know coming from brattleboro and driving down your main street um i i get some feelings about how lush it is um and i think we all have like the responsibilities we're carrying as a, as a towns and we all have um the burdens that we carry as towns and all of our kids deserve much better schools than your school is right now well if, but if a there... glimmer of hope we we're supposed to have a glimmer of hope um vermonters have done really hard things before and we're capable of doing really hard things again and 
change is going to happen whether we want it to or not. Change happens every day. And we have a responsibility here and an opportunity here to manage that change instead of letting that change manage us. And it's going to take all of us to pitch in and manage that change together. I, I would say just to close is that there is more focus on the issues we're talking about now as being a priority within the state legislature or the candidates certainly running for state legislature um, to bring that to the session starting in January. Um, so that becomes a very high priority. There are a lot of very important things in, in the state, um, but this is, I would say, extremely important uh, and certainly for our local community. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for spending an hour and a half with us. All right. Thank you. All right. For all you folks on Zoom, thanks and have a good night.